Welcome, please, Ellen McCarthy to the podium, and she will lead you into this session on place-led urbanization. Over to you, Ellen. So, welcome to the question, welcome to the session that asks the question, how can we recenter architecture in place? Uh, or how, how can we keep from turning out really bad placemaking projects? My name is Ellen McCarthy. I'm an adjunct professor of planning at Georgetown University and the former planning director of Washington, D.C. I want to thank PPS for pulling together this wonderful conference with so many interesting and knowledgeable people. I especially want to thank PPS for me personally to provide an opportunity to check out Vancouver residential real estate early, just in case things don't go quite right at the US election on November 8th. <laughs> so, so far, you have seen countless examples of really cool places. Our panelists today have been responsible for creating many in a wide variety of geographic and cultural contexts. Their de detailed bios are on the PPS website, placemakingweek.org slash PLF slash schedule. And so since we're a little short on time and we do get the lovely position of being the second to the last session between you and drinks, um, we'll try to be very prompt uh, and not spend a lot of time on the introductions. So you've seen many examples of great placemaking, and yet we know there are so many other opportunities and so many projects that are not so great. How can we increase the success of taking advantage of those opportunities? We've asked our panelists to speak for five minutes each to start off with on what they've experienced as the greatest obstacles as they've uh, tried to, to design successful projects and what they have found to be a, a successful approach or tool for overcoming those obstacles. Uh, we'll also aim to allow for sufficient time at the end of the session so we can have a good discussion and interaction with all of you. So, uh, oh. And, and we do have a, a variety of professions here, all of whom have been maligned in the process of placemaking. Uh, so we have two architects, two planners, two developers. So we're, we're all up here as easy targets for you. Um, I, I would start off by saying as a planner, if I were to name one of the biggest obstacles that I've faced in trying to create interesting places, it's been uh, the nimbyism and the resistance to change on the part of communities that have a very hard time, especially those that have lived in this neighborhood for 22 years, uh, that have a very hard time in imagining that there could be something different that actually could be better than what they have. And I would say one of the best tools that I've found are the great images that are on the PPS website and that are available in other places to try to help people who have a little bit of a failure of imagination. So, to start off, uh, we will, okay. So that, that's my contribution at any rate to obstacles. Our first speaker is Ricardo Berman. Uh, he's a reformed uh, physicist, uh, former physics student at least, who is now turned developer. Ricardo, uh, from uh, Brazil. Thank you everyone. So uh, we were asked to, to come here and talk a little bit about the obstacles of creating a more place-led uh, environment for uh, everything that we do. And uh, as Helen said, we are developers in Brazil. So the first thing I would like to do is to ask a show of hands here if you are a real estate developer in the room. One, two, three, four. Good, four people. <laughs> Any bankers? 
Okay, so we're not the least represented crowd here. It's uh, the second least. But uh, the, one thing we were discussing about obstacles, and I guess uh, the first thing I was going to say would be that we keep pointing our fingers at each other. So we are always blaming the architects. Uh, we're always bl blaming the city officials. We're always blaming everyone else. And everyone else kind of is always blaming the developers. So uh, it's, that's, that's one of the key things, I think, that we have to start off right from there. That's, we have to think together in terms of uh, how to make things better, regardless of what our role in this whole process is. And, uh, but still, as Hans said, uh, it's hard to point out obstacles without pointing, out, pointing the fingers. So this first thing, uh, the fact that we are uh, not represented here, I think that's already a challenge. I think that's my first uh, acid uh, criticism. <laughs> I think that we have to start by thinking of, of uh, really, we're talking about diversity, inclusion, all those things. So we have to be, have a diverse crowd and that inclusive crowd into everything. That we're trying to talk about real estate development. We're talking about placemaking in those developments. And uh, well, the developers are not here. And uh, I think us, as a, as a, as a, as a crowd, we are, relatively rational people. So I think we could relate to all those very, this is very practical, common sense things that we come, that we gain from all these conferences. We've been involved with place making for uh, several number of years. Uh, we've been working and collaborating with PPS for a while, and we try to bring their insights on everything that we do. And uh, just because this image is there, I just have to at least say what that is. And that's a, a large corporate building that we are, it's currently under, under construction in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that we're doing. And that's a, like a, an immense uh, tower on Faria Lima Avenue, which is like our fifth avenue. It's like the main corporate district in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. And we've made a, a design choice to put the building sideways on the site in order to clear that 6,000 square meter urban public open plaza right in front of that avenue. No, none of other buildings there have this kind of public amenity there. This is something that we came up with after being to these conferences and after talking to Fred and other people passionate about this issue of placemaking. And we made that decision not because we are enlightened by the placemaking uh, ideas or anything like that, but because we think that's good money. It's a very practical decision. It's better, it's more valuable for us to have the, the, the building next to this amazing destination in town. So that is our rationale in terms of why to do this, why to push forward on these things. And so uh, that's why we're doing it. I think that's a very, uh, as noble as any other uh, purpose in, in, in pursuing those, those things. Uh, there are several things I, I could talk about this project, but I'll, I'll, uh, we want to leave a lot, of question, a lot of time for questions and for everyone to be, be involved. So I'm here as the, the, the bad guy in the room, but uh, I'm available for, for, to, to try to kind of convince you guys that we might not be so bad. Besides that, Ricardo, I'm sure there are a lot of people in the room who would be happy to point fingers at architects or planners as the bad guys in the room. So, uh, Our next speaker is Dana Crawford from Denver. Uh, Dana really led the way uh, with the pathbreaking project at Larimer Square, really one of the first adaptive reuses of historic buildings in the country, and it showed people that there are was an alternative to just knocking down old buildings on a site uh, that you could actually create great, lively, mixed-use places by, uh, by repurposing those buildings. So, Dana? Oh, and... And Dana has been... Uh, but she didn't just stop with Larimer Square, so... Her latest project that has kept her very busy is the massive redevelopment of the Union Station area in D Denver. Dana. Thank you, Ellen. Well, uh, with the purpose of being inclusionary, I would really like to know how many of you are English lit majors. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have three 
seat right down in front. I guess that tells the story, doesn't it? Um, thank you all for being here at such a late hour. And Kathy Madden gave instructions to the panel to either make you laugh or cry. Now, I've been near tears a number of times uh, over the last few days with so many poignant stories about placemaking. And yet, I do feel close to tears because I, for the last 50 years, have described myself as a preservationist. And it's very interesting that I don't think I've heard preservation as a word one time in this meeting. And I think the placemaking movement really started with the preservationists. And one of the things that has happened is that preservation is a movement, it's an accepted movement, and success might get it in trouble because it's become so precious. Everybody gets involved with every little damn detail. <laughs> Especially architects. <laughs> now you see, I've been in training for quite a long time with Fred Kent, who loves to insult architects. <laughs> and he also loves to insult landscape architects and, I guess now, preservationists because I can't even get the word used. So you can imagine how tragic it is to feel like such a failure after working so damned hard the last 5,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, there are a lot of topics I would like to mention and the obstacles have been obvious through those years. Money, urban renewal authorities, um, architects, um, government. <laughs> urban renewal authorities, government, um, and lack of patience has been also something of an obstacle. But um, overall, when you attend a meeting like this, I, I just have to say that this has been quite thrilling. And we have just finished two years ago the Denver Union Station Project, which has been described all over the world as a transformative project that involved so many of the words that we've discussed here, and especially collaboration with so many different types of government and so many different bankers. And, um, and such a big success, and hospitality. And we were, um, around the first of the year, described by Forbes as the hippest hotel, one of the 10 hippest hotels in the world. So, how about that? <laughs> and then you wanna tell your quick story about the- The obstacles? The well, of course, um, most, of the, most of the projects I've been involved with have gone through a period of time where the government wanted to tear them down. And the Denver Union Station is really uh, built in two different architectural eras, the 1880s and then uh, a Beaux-Arts building in 1914. And the city at one time wanted to sell, you know, tear it all down. That'd be the easiest thing, just get rid of it. Uh, and so John Hickenlooper, who is now our mayor and was our uh, is now our governor and was our mayor for quite a while, and you know, almost was our candidate for vice president, and, and is famous because of his name, uh, started, opened a pub across the street from the Union Station, a beer, beer hall. Have you noticed how alcohol has really been in, involved with a lot of our conversations about, we went out and had a glass of wine or we had beers with the engineers or something? I, I, it's my theory that if alcohol goes away, it's all over. <laughs> but at any rate, John Hickenlooper and I put up petitions all over the brew pub, SOS, Save Our Station, and we determined by scientific measurement that after three beers, it was very easy to get everybody to sign. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. So you've got that. Whoops, you've got that as an important tool: uh, alcohol, uh, alcohol, and petitions. This is yours, Otto. Yes. Um, so.
So I was supposed to do this in alphabetical order, but I obviously am, by this time on, time on Friday, I'm losing track of my alphabet. Uh, so Otto Condon is a architect, um, but actually, uh, while he's a principal in the architecture firm of ZGF, he is uh, a senior urban designer, and we know that urban designers are, they're, they're not quite as, um, uh, 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 and object fixated as, uh, as some of those bad architects. Uh, uh, at any rate, uh, oops. Uh, so Otto from, from uh, ZGF has 25 years of experience in designing projects in a wide variety of places. And Otto, take it away. Uh, thank you. So I have worked in the Northwest, but now working in DC, I find that a lot of my work is about repairing the sins of my fathers, our fathers, um, whether it's urban renewal. Um, as I mean, the project on the, on the image right now is the Southwest Eco District, which was how to envision a neighborhood that is a, was urban, it was demolished from, through urban renewal, became a government, government enclave, and how does it become a community? But there were no community members. So actually, in listening to uh, the various discussions today, I, I want to talk about a different project. Um, and highlight some of the, uh, what I've heard, and I think it reiterates some of the lessons and some of the obstacles and maybe how to overcome some of those obstacles. It was, it's called the Columbia Heights Public Realm Plan in DC. DC is a very segregated city. This Columbia Heights is, in Ward 1, it's the most integrated city, about an even mix of uh, white, uh, African American, Hispanic, and an Asian population. It burned out in the 68 riots, saw no dis, it was, disinvestment for 30 years and depopulated. In the early 2000s, we were hired by the Office of Planning to do a public realm plan. And as architects, we said, we, can't, we can design you a project, and that's, design is probably the easiest, but what it really needs to be is a community building process, and that it's not just about designing a plaza. And working with the Office of Planning, we said, okay, let's set the rules down that the city when they, make, when they make promises, they'll keep them. Let's work with developers to ensure that they're well-intentioned and understand that the public realm does contribute value to space. And let's ensure that the community really owns the design because ultimately they're gonna have to be stewards. Um, and so through that process, we first identified the community leaders to help train them to be part of the design team. And we called them the design, the, actually the core design team. Um, and we invited um, elderly members of the community, younger members of the community, younger members of the community, and skeptical members of the community. And one particular's name was Matt, who was like, he came to our meeting and said, "I don't think you guys are going to do anything." By the time we worked through the tools we were going to use with the community, which because it was trilingual, we used gaming pieces um, in Vietnamese. Uh, his, um, uh, and for, to, to address the Hispanic community and also um, all the, the, the rest of the community's um, members. And we actually had the community leaders lead all the workshops with us supporting them. Um, and I do think as a, as a designer, professional designer, you know, it's a fine line between um, how do you let community members, or how do community members provide input, and how do we as design professionals actually help to bring the quality of you know, our design abilities to really make it more than just kind of, I'll say, at least the sort of least common denominator approach to design. And I think that's a really critical role for a designer. Um, through the process as we developed the designs, uh, also it's about trust. I think you, know, you go outside the scope of, of uh, contracts and when we were doing neighborhood walks, which allowed the elderly members of the, of the community to meet the new members of the community and actually understand that they all have some of the same aspirations. It's really about letting them talk to, to each other. Um, and also sometimes I think one community member said that after a day of standing out in July in DC in 105 degree heat in a community marketplace that that was the moment they actually believed us as design professionals would do right by them. So you do have to pretty much as any design professional out there, you know, you have to go beyond the contract. Um, you know, because we invested in training the community, uh, 
it, this was, I mean, it was 30 years in the making since the riots. Um, it was a year of doing the plan and then probably six years of getting it funded. And so the community was seeing a lot of new, pop, uh, new populations because the transit, the new metro st station had opened. Um, and so there was some transition. DC's rather transitional, kind of four year terms. Uh, there was a new mayor who wasn't invested in the, in the program. He may have been influenced by some of the developers who uh, were trying to not do all the deals because they were making contributions. Because we had educated, the, it helped the, ed, the community members be able to tell the story of the design and the solutions, both from a physical design, from a transportation solution about um, safety for the streets. When they sort of conveniently got the mayor to come out to the neighborhood on something else, and we kind of worked through to give them the models, all the boards, all the easels, they set it up in the blank public space, which was a gravel-filled lot, and they literally held the mayor there hostage and wouldn't let him leave until he committed to truly funding the process. And I think that's really kind of the, one of the lessons of being a design professional, and I'll end it with that, um, that uh, you, know, you really need a lot of, for a project to be successful, you need a lot of parents. In other words, just get them in a, in a gravel pit? <laughs> if that's what it takes. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's uh, the next tool. Stand in a gravel pit, sweat, and show that you're really committed. <laughs> so uh, so we've, we've heard from two continents already, and now we go to the third. P.K. Das is an architect activist uh, from India who has focused on trying to create a closer relationship between the citizens and the design process, and he will tell you about that now, BK. Thank you. Well, we as a panel of experts are supposed to suggest how to get over the obstacles, right? And uh, one thing I haven't figured out is how to get over the obstacles that we ourselves create as professionals. Uh, in any case, our governments, particularly in India or the place in Mumbai where I work, uh, always consider some of us as causing obstacles to the path of development. So they obviously, you know, look upon us as people who create obstacles and not clear them. So uh, I think my time could start now. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll just make five points <clears throat> in the five minutes that's been allotted to me. Uh, the first is that I seriously consider, and I suggest, and I propose this, that public spaces must clearly be the foundation of city planning. And this is one of the things uh, upon which I've been working for the past uh, 30, 35 years. Um, it is, in fact, a very simple thing that I'm talking about. We know very clearly that the quality of public spaces in a city really reflects the quality and dignity of public life and vice versa. And therefore, that's a terrific means or, uh, or, a, yeah, or, a, or a platform through which we could work uh, to achieve many goals uh, and maybe get over certain obstacles. But very sadly, as we experience world over, as cities are expanding, public spaces are shrinking. Uh, and, and this is of really of serious concern to us. Um, and we hope that public uh, architecture of public open spaces or public spaces uh, would generate wider public dialogue and engagement. So how do we draw really uh, the wider public uh, into a discussion, into dialogue on architecture of public spaces? Uh, and what is interesting in this is that when people get engaged into the discussion on architecture of public spaces, that they would begin to then exert pressures on governments uh, in, in decisions that affect their lives and their cities and spaces. Um, so, so that's the first point I was making about uh, the public spaces architecture uh, and the need to work on that. The second is a point which I uh, sort of say that architecture is an instrument that could steer public dialogue. And this is very important and interesting. So it's, it's a, 
you could, through the issues of architectural decisions, uh, steer up a public dialogue and discussion and thereby enable participation. So it's a kind of a bottom-up process that we're talking about. But what's very important in this is to bring about, uh, through architecture, what we often do is build edifices. It's physical reflection of social and other ideas that people and communities have. It's, it could be brick and mortar, but we definitely translate social political ideas to forms of spaces and structures. So we leave for, not for a short time, but for many, many years, these edifices that we build, and that's serious. It's not something that you draw and you can erase it out so fast and quickly. And therefore, it is so important to do that. And one of the ways to, therefore, engage public or people into the process of architecture is from our experience we've seen is through a neighborhood effort through neighborhood planning, as we have been discussing here in many of the sessions. And uh, therefore, for both reasons, that is to facilitate uh, participation and recenter architecture on place, neighborhood-based planning would be an effective means for re-envisioning our cities. The fourth point that I'd like to make before you is how do we popularize architecture? Through our long years of education, we have uh, developed an exclusive skill of communication, of expertise. Uh, we speak in languages, we draw in ways that if we put them up in public spaces that nobody can understand. Plants are often alienating. So how do we really break those barriers in a sense? How do we evolve and devise new languages of communication with the public in public spaces? And that's, a, that's really a test of the time for professionals. And that could probably only happen when we begin to intermingle away from our small communities of experts with larger social movements uh, in neighborhoods, et cetera. The last point which I'd like to make is really um, how do we then democratize uh, our space, public spaces, uh, places, neighborhoods, and the city as a whole uh, through effort in architecture and planning? So ensuring participation, planning, and architecture practices, I consider participation in architectural decisions and practices a right. Right to participate in planning and architectural decisions. So that's almost like any other human rights would be effectively what I would like to conclude with. Thank you. Thank you, PK. Um, our last speaker you already met yesterday afternoon, Harst Karstenberg, is from our yet another uh, continent and the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, if you did not take appropriate notes when Hans was uh, showing his slides and the reference to the open source document that, w that uh, his group put together, the city at eye level, um, I, I, for one, would give it a, uh, an unsolicited testimonial that it is um, such, a, such a, a rich grappling with what really are the elements and the design of cities and particularly in streets that would that make them feel like lively and vital places. So, Hans? Thank you very much. Since uh, this is turning into a Friday afternoon therapeutic uh, session, uh, where we all get rid of our anger. Uh, I would like to start with architects, I'm sorry, uh, but planners as well, my own profession. But I'm going to end with cities, uh, so watch out. Um, so when I walk the streets, and that's what I love to do best, uh, and meet with people and look around, there's so many buildings I encounter that make me angry all the time, to the point, th therapeutic session, right? Um, to the point that it's not much fun for my family to go on holiday with me anymore. <laughs> so, <sighs> how does that come about? Because we, are, we have so much knowledge on how to get it right. Or do we? So we, we are working a lot uh, with architecture students uh, giving guest lectures because of the book 
Um, and usually, when we are allowed to give the guest lecture, they're in their fourth year. And it doesn't matter whether they're in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Brazil, uh, in Greece. Um, it's more or less the same pattern. I've come to the conclusion that uh, architecture students and in their, in their designs and, and architects, they, it's not that they want to create terrible public spaces with their buildings. They don't want to do that. They're just not aware of that that's what they're doing. So they just don't know that they're creating public space. They don't know it. They're in the fourth year and they've never been taught that the uh, buildings they create are a very crucial part of the experience of public space. So nine out of 10 time, talking about the city at eye level for them is just one big eye opener. It's just something they, they, they were never taught, so maybe we should finger point at their professors. I don't know. <laughs> are there any professors here in the room? Uh, the, yeah, okay, very courageous. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, so, but this is something we can do something about, right? Because we all know this. How many people are here in the audience? 400? 400? So if we each take as a premonition now that within the next three months we will give a guest lecture for 50 architecture students and planners, shall we all do that? Then we reach, I guess, 20,000 people and we've saved 20,000 cities, right? <laughs> so that's a... Take the pledge, everyone. Take the pledge. Are we okay on that? Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so we needed more hugging. That's what we said on the first day. I would hug an architect. Um, so a, a second thing I would like to say is that for city governments, um, in the processes that we work in, um, city governments aren't aware they, uh, uh, they uh, make decisions about buildings and then make decisions about public space either. So I think all the building codes need to be changed, by the way. But, 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 but um, as much as I like the placemaking, quicker, lighter, cheaper phrase, and it really helps us a lot in our work, uh, creating uh, 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 trains like these, which become a restaurant in a place which you would never have imagined in any kind of master plan, right? Serendipity. For a lot of governments that we work with, Quicker, lighter, cheaper is an excuse to get rid of the process quicker, lighter, cheaper. <laughs> so I'm becoming increasingly interested in to create cooperative um, uh, coalitions between people from the area, residents, being inclusive, um, landowners, governments, to create coalitions for place management first because changing streets and places around is something you do over the course of at least 10 years. It's not something you do only quicker, lighter, cheaper. And when you've done that, then we can start on working uh, on, on quicker, lighter, cheaper changes. So I would like to leave it at that, and it was, feel, feels very, I feel much better now. Thank you very much. <laughs> So um, I guess I'd like to pick up a little bit on uh, something that Otto said that I think you all uh, have uh, would have useful reflections about this. We talked about the importance of involving the users and the people that are, are there where the rubber meets the road, basically, uh, to create successful places. But how do you balance your uh, professional expertise and uh, be because creating great places isn't a completely amateur activity. Uh, so how do you balance the expertise that you bring to the project with uh, being open and inclusive of people who, who don't have a design background but who have useful information to provide to you? I don't know, maybe you want to start since you brought it up. Well, I think that's why I kind of got into, I said the lowest common denominator because sometimes people will have a reaction. You, know, you don't want designers to basically just you never want it to be just a pencil, um, that, but they can add quality and, and value and beauty to the design. And so if you get a comment from a community member, you know, the first thing to do is really try to dig deeper and find out what they really mean or what they really want or what are the sort of options. And so we, we have pretty much a three-step process. It's like, you know, we go to listen, 
Then we come back with ideas to test. And really, te and it's a goal-based process to see if the, the range of ideas um, can really start to help be physical manifestations of what the goals are from the community. And, you know, I think some of the best um, comments are is when the community member said, wow, that responds to what I was saying, but that's not at all what I thought I would ever think of. And I think that's really what, you know, that is design professionals we can bring. Can I, I would just add on that with an example from that same project over there. Uh, one thing that happened on that project that was shown there was that uh, at first when community around it heard there was a, there's a strong residential community right behind that. So when they first heard that project was going to take place, I mean, there were like an uh, enormous number of manifestations from organizations and, and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, entities there. Uh, including towards the city, saying that they were opposing that project, and they had never even, I mean, they had never seen anything about the project. It was, it was just against anything to take place there. And so uh, we took this approach of, of going towards them, knocking on doors, and, and asking them to, to come and to listen and to, 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 to understand what it is that we were proposing for that place. And I have to say, to be very honest, that there was not so much of a feedback loop on that. So it's not that uh, we got, we gathered contributions to change the design, but uh, to rather we, we wanted to show them what were some of the decisions that we had already made, uh, in part thanks to the, 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 what the, the, the discussions and the training that we had with PPS and others, that we were already trying to accommodate other uses for that place, so that it was something that they could take advantage of. So. Uh, we had one of the discussions, and then afterwards, just to mention that they even were starting writing letters to the city saying that they supported the project and things like that, so that was very interesting. But uh, one of the, the discussions that we had in that process was with the architect of the building tower, because he said he had this vision of, he's a very modernistic architect, and he had this vision of a, a very geometric shape, you know, touching base on the ground and making that perfect uh, <laughs> square angle and things like that. And we said, we have to carve out a piece of the building, you know, put a canopy, make some shade, some <laughs> integration. And that was, the discussion was, uh, was in terms of uh, things like that. And I think that the open environment for, for dialogue was saying that we have to compromise, we have to find midterms. You know, we have other stakeholders in this. We have the, pro the investors that want their corporate tower there. We, there's nothing we can do. One thing that we talk to Fred a lot is we have to, uh, and we were discussing this with Andy as well these other days, was like uh, sky rises. This is a sky rise. And uh, my reflection on this is what does it matter if it's a sky rise? How, the, how does it matter how many floors it's got if at least it's got the ground floor right? Kay. So on the ground floor is something that we have to get everyone involved and there is, it's a more participatory thing on the last floor there, if the architect wants to do something very crazy, and that, that's okay, that's his business. But <laughs> can, I, can I make a quick suggestion here, Ricardo? Yeah. Because uh, I, it, it's not a critique, because I think you're a good guy. And, and PK was talking about how uh, to popularize architecture. I think we should stop communicating with pictures made from the air. <laughs> we, we are not birds, right? We, we are on the ground. We should start communicating with pictures on the street level. So, um, and I, I guess that's also the difference between the language that architects understand and uh, the language that, that uh, just people in the streets will understand. We're working on the Schaubergplein, which is ranking the w world's worst squares in the world, plazas in the world on the PPS list. Um, and it looks beautiful from the air. Beautiful. It's in all the landscape architect and design books, as an example, with pictures from the air until you get on the square and, and you're actually a person there. So. Well, I, I live in... in w w when did you complete your studies in architecture? No, I d I, I'm a planner myself. Oh, you're a planner. So. But the point I was making is, you know, there is in, in our course, in our training, there's something called drawing bird's eye view. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, would, I would add something to that, drawing so the city at eye level, maybe. <laughs> yeah. maybe I mean, that's the same thing. What I'm saying is you're trained to look from the outside. So, PK, are you saying that's the explanation as to why so many people think the architecture of various buildings is for the birds? <laughs> Sorry, say that again? It, it, it's, a, it's a slang term. When you say something is for the birds, it means, you know, 
not, not good. <laughs> well, so. that's not exactly what it means. <laughs> But, you know, but, I, but I agree with him that, you know, we have to start seeing buildings as a part of a public space's structure. This is extremely important. Otherwise, buildings and architectural buildings are becoming like barriers in the landscapes of cities. And if it's conceived in a very different way by seeing it as a part of a public space's structure. Can I just say that uh, what's we, like, this is very interesting, actually, because uh, when you go to building codes, for instance, all building codes reflect things that you have to do inwards on your side. There is, I mean, I don't know of other countries, but in Brazil, there is not one, uh, we have huge building codes, terrible red tape, but they all talk about things like the proportion between the, the size of the window and the size of the room that the windows, things like that. It's just crazy and, uh, and, uh, and so you, in, sometimes <coughs> they're not even evidence-based, it's just random, wrong, but there is nothing discussing how the building should interact with the street level and things like that. So uh, if we're gonna talk about obstacles, I mean, we waste so much time discussing these stupid details that in the end will not make a difference in, in the city. And then we could, all that, that's all human time. That's all people working, it's money, it's, uh, it's a human effort. And then people thinking, then discussing things. And all that effort could be put into more of a, uh, uh, into themes that are much more relevant than the things that we discussed today. Yeah, I think it is a somewhat of a uh, sad commentary on zoning that uh, with the exception, or I guess part of the reason for the popularity of form-based zoning was because otherwise zoning codes specifically eschew anything about the public realm and it is only the building itself and very little about the relationship of the building to to the site or to, to what's around it. I know, Dana, did you uh, wanna chime in on that? <coughs> well, I think flexibility is an enormously important word. <coughs> and uh, I, I think flexibility is a very important word. When, when we start a project, um, every project is different, and it's all different locations, all different sets of demographics, and we have usually at least four public forums that are planned at days and times when all kinds of people can attend and, and many people are specifically invited to attend. And, and we have questionnaires because what we're looking for is the uses that people want in the buildings or the projects that are coming along and you can, when we did the Denver Union Station, uh, it was really interesting because, of course, it's a transit, and a lot more guys came to the meetings than gals <laughs> because they love trains. But when we <laughs> talked about did they want shops, they said no, they wanted adult beverages. <laughs> and so, of course, we have shops and adult beverages, but. You, you learn it, and we don't even get into the design phase until we find out <coughs> what the people want, you know, for the uses. And PPS teaches that the people are the experts, and you know, you hardly need a bigger slogan than that. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the themes that we've heard quite a bit about is uh, the importance of creating spaces in which a variety of different types of people can feel comfortable. Um, in one of my sessions, a person referred to it as, how do we avoid uh, uh, driving the middle class into, into a screaming nightmare, was it? Or some similar, uh, similar feeling like that in terms of asking them to be comfortable in a space where there were a diversity of, of people. Uh, I know this has been a particular focus of yours, PK. What, what do you think are the important lessons for designers and architects to learn about creating spaces that can make a diversity of uh, people feel comfortable being in that space? Well, that's a very difficult question. I certainly don't have an absolute answer uh, to solve this problem. Let me confess with that. Uh, but surely we have to, uh, we're struggling with that question and we will continue to struggle with that question. I think one of the things that, you know, could probably uh, pave a way towards that uh, achievement would be uh, to discuss the very brief from inception uh, of a development, including 
a building or a cluster of buildings or of an entire neighborhood. What happens is um, public engagement often is at a very late stage. After um, a private developer or a government uh, evolves a program, requirements of a building or a place, then the architects get on the job, the planners get on the job, and once it's formed up, it's only then at some point, somewhere, not always everywhere, it's put to public um, sort of response. But my point is, can architectural brief, can planning brief itself be evolved through public dialogue? Which means it takes it to the point she was making, really, whether there should be shops or not shops in a particular place, or there should be a high rise or not a high rise in a particular place, or what kind of functions would be at a particular place and not there. You know, there are much wider issues, of course. We're just discussing buildings. It could be landscapes, it could be natural areas, for example, our responses to natural areas while uh, designing um, neighborhoods or buildings or clusters of buildings. Um, do we incorporate, do we integrate the natural areas with the architecture of the place? Often, historically, we've always seen them as a separate zone, a separate area, and we've drawn boundaries and barriers between the natural areas, whether they're rivers, creeks, hills, wetlands, forests, whatever they are. So can such integration happen through a public, wider public discussion from which can evolve the program for development? I mean, right from inception. I mean, that's probably one way of looking at it and would probably then take us to very new dynamics of situations that we can't just sort of prescribe or write out from the beginning because it would have to be an, a process that sort of evolves over a period of time with discussions and debates. Dana said she... Uh, oh, well, your comment. question about the comfort of the middle class, I think society is taking care of it by eliminating the middle class. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one solution. Somebody would like to ask a question. Okay, yes. Yeah. Oh, that's not somebody, that's Fred. <laughs> I tricked you. <laughs> yeah. Whenever I see an architectural drawing, it's about architecture and landscape design. You know it sucks. Because uh, I learned from Ricardo that don't let architects design the bottom three floors. And the public spaces themselves need to be more about a visual set of uses that people are partic participating in. The building above the, the first three floors can be depicted, and then maybe a vision of what those uses might be. And then as the building goes, gets closer to being built, and then it's as it's being built, the uses within the bottom of the building can begin to take shape because you don't know what's going to go in them and the outside public spaces as people begin to use it. So you can do stage sets. You can kind of gradually move over what I believe is a lighter, quicker, cheaper phase and getting to where you really have a great outcome because the building's new. How do you know five years from now what those uses are going to be? So the solution is to get away from having to show a design to show the uses and say they're what we think now and then a year before, it's, uh, as it's under construction, you do the next phase, and then as people move into it, you do the next one. So you have the flexibility, which Dana's talking about. In the end, you can get a really great project that isn't about architecture, it's about a place. Yeah, there's, there, there's this one, <laughs> there's this wonderful contribution uh, that we got in our book by Jos Gadet about a street in Amsterdam analyzing, and the street is 200 years old, and they've analyzed what was in the, on the ground floor. And it had at least 20 different functions through the decades. People were living there, there, were, there, were, there was a, a certain industry in the beginning, then we thought that wasn't a good idea anymore in cities, so uh, it became a workspace, then it became a shop, now it's a, 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 a cafe. So. Uh, I guess we need to design for that kind of uh, flexibility in use. And we don't get that with our uh, 
with the type of large scale development we see nowadays where you get boring large facades of at least 550 to 100 meters with only glass uh, and, a, and a very uh, tight structure that doesn't allow for this type of change. So I agree with Fred. Might I add okay. something? Uh, I think there is a, a very strong cultural thing that we have to acknowledge here and, and, and tackle. It's that, that we have, I, I believe, well, at least in my country, I cannot speak for other countries, but in Brazil, we have this strong planning culture. So it's, it's a culture of kind of predicting the future culture. And it, it's, I think that is a, it's a problem with that. So our, our zonings are like extremely restricted in terms of, and, and they are the main, we're talking about obstacles, they're the main obstacles in terms of allowing that such flexibility to take place. We're doing this big project in Brasilia, and we want to put uh, uh, live workspaces. And they don't have that category in zoning, so it, you cannot do live work. <laughs> but, uh, and I say, why not? Well, we just can't. It's not. I mean, the guy who did the list of possible categories did not foresee that. So because of that, you cannot do that. So it, this is crazy. And, and so uh, flexibility takes a certain degree of trust. We have to, uh, we have to kind of let go a little bit and let things just happen and evolve. Otherwise, those scenarios that Fred is talking about, it's impossible to, to, to at least, well, in the structures that we have in place. And so I think that's, that's one strong point I would like to make. As I know, uh, in the DC zoning code a few years ago, when someone wanted to open a health club, a fitness facility, the zoning administrator poured through the zoning code trying to find a fitness facility or a health club, and he ended up saying, well, I think you can go in this zone because it does allow public baths. <laughs> <laughs> so, do we have any more time for an audience question? Okay. Well, thank you very much for a terrific dialogue, uh, guys. Thank you. Thank you audience.